Okay, so um, good morning uh, or afternoon, depending on where you are, uh, to everybody. Thanks a lot uh, to the organizers of this uh, workshop for the opportunity and for the invitation to give a talk here. I have to say that it's really a pleasure to, uh, uh, I, I think this is the second time that they give a talk in this, uh, in this workshop. The first one was around 10 or 12 years ago, actually a long time ago. So I was very happy when I received the invitation because I thought, oh yeah, I can go again to LA because I like it so much. And then, you know, we have to do this online. So, uh, so, so yeah, you will have to invite me once again in the future. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. And nevertheless, so uh, it's great to be here. Thanks a lot. In this, uh, in this talk, I, I want to, uh, I want to explain you about some, some recent results using tensor network methods that we've been uh, doing on our group on a variety of, um, of uh, Hamiltonians and problems in uh, condensed matter physics and also a little bit beyond this, as you will see. So uh, this is the uh, summary of my talk. First, I want to start with some basics, even though this is a tensor network workshop, and I guess that you guys already know what tensor networks are. Still, then I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, results that we obtained for the briefing Kagome antiferromagnet. Uh, also, uh, in point three, about three dimensional uh, bosons at finite temperature, and also about KTF models in 3D at finite temperature. Okay. Uh, in point number four, I would like to, to say a few words about some simulations that we did using um, PEPs with SU2 symmetry at the numerical level. Um, and finally, I want to tell you about, uh, this is a little bit of a, something a bit exotic, about how to optimize investment portfolios okay, using tensor networks. And you will realize that it's as difficult as solving a spin glass problem. And that's the connection to uh, condensed matter physics, actually. So uh, let's see how much I have time to, to do. I think I have half an hour, so let's, let's move on. OK, let's start with the basics. Um, I don't think I have to introduce too much what is a tensor network uh, to you, but nevertheless, let me just remind you that the idea of tensor networks is to pick up the coefficient of the many body wave function in some particular basis. And this is a huge tensor that depends on exponentially many parameters, and uh, it's very inefficient to handle it exactly. Uh, and we are going to represent it using tensor network diagrams that I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with, uh, like this one. Um, this is an example of one of these coefficients. It's a tensor with nine indices for the case of having, uh, say, nine particles, okay, or nine spins. Uh, in this graphical notation, so the shapes are the, the tensors, the lines are the indices of the tensors, and this is an example of, of, a, of a tensor with, with nine indices. Now, the idea of tensor networks, as you know, is to break this big tensor into fundamental pieces. It's kind of a quantization of the wave function itself, OK? Um, we break it using the entanglement structure, and there are many possibilities here. The most famous tensor network by far is matrix plot states, as you know. This is at the basis of many numerical methods, such as the MRG, uh, TBD, uh, power wave function renormalization group, uh, and many more. We can go, um, well, there are different types of indices, sorry. Um, physical indices that correspond to local Hilbert spaces and also bond indices that are the ones that are carrying the entanglement in the wave function and are the ones also that are connecting the whole tensor network structure, okay? Now, we can generalize this idea to higher dimensional systems. Then we find uh, projected entangled pair states or tensor product states. Um, they are also at the basis of many numerical algorithms uh, nowadays that are very successful. PEPs algorithms, tensor product variational approach, IPEPs, tensor entanglement renormalization group, and many more. Now, you can be as creative as you want here. Uh, you can. Um, try to develop a tensor network depending on what is the quantum state of matter that you want to describe. And this is another example that is also very well known. This is the MERA for multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz. The MERA has uh, many nice properties. Uh, I will not be talking about the MERA in, in this talk, but uh, um, you know, it's uh, just to say that this is a typical um, state that is describing quantum critical states of matter. Now, the idea of tensor networks, as you know very well, is that by using the representations, we can uh, reduce the complexity of the description of the quantum state uh, from something that is exponential in the size of the system to something that scales uh, efficiently as a polynomial in the size of the system. And not only that, but these families of states also satisfy the area law for the entanglement entropy, as it, we know that it will happen for low energy states of quantum matter, and they are also low energy eigenstates of, of local Hamiltonians, okay, as, as we know. Now, 
Um, it's interesting because every time I give a talk about tensor networks, I have to, to expand this, uh, this slide. This is what I call the tensor network Big Bang. Uh, every time I, uh, so every a few years, somebody rediscovers tensor networks in a completely different context. And then I have to add one more leg to this, to this slide. Okay. So, um, so, you know, you don't find tensor networks just in condensed matter physics. Of course, you can, you, you, you find them when you want to describe quantum states of matter at low energies. That's exactly the structure of, of the quantum many body state that you find when you, you realize that there is an entanglement structure there and you, oh, look, there is a, something here and it turns out that it's a tensor network. No? Well, it turns out that tensor networks show up in many other places. Essentially, anywhere that one has a correlated structure of uh, variables, okay, or a, high di or a vector in a high dimensional uh, vector space uh, that is involving some high very strong correlations. Uh, there is a tensor network behind, okay, always. And, and that's not exclusive of, of quantum many body physics. Here, there are some examples, quantum gravity and HC, DSCFT, classical statistical mechanics, of course, even in deep learning, okay, and machine learning, and even in linguistics, in finance, as I will explain you towards the end, material science, chemistry, nuclear physics, and so on and so forth, okay? There are lots of applications, and I think there are, there are were already some talks in this uh, conference about uh, machine learning with tensor networks. That's just another example, okay? Turns out that uh, all these high dimensional vectors that we are dealing with when inventing new machine learning algorithms, uh, we can handle them with tensor networks in a more efficient way, okay? So uh, I wonder what's gonna be the new, the new field of tensor networks in five years. Somebody will rediscover it again, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. Okay, but that time maybe I, I, I'm gonna need two slides inst instead of one. So let's move on. Um, next thing I want to explain to you is about uh, simulations that we did for the breathing Kagome antiferromagnet. Um, this is the problem that we were dealing with. Um, we have a two dimensional quantum spin system uh, of spins one half sitting on the uh, vertices of uh, Kagome lattice. Uh, so this is just the, like, the usual spin one half Kagome Heisenberg antiferromagnet with antiferromagnetic interactions. But this time, since we are on a Kagome lattice, you know, there are upper and lower triangles. And we are going to give a different coupling to the upper and to the lower triangles. All right. This is the, um, the so called breathing Kagome antiferromagnet, okay, where we have these two couplings. Now, there are many motivations uh, for, this, uh, for this model. Uh, first of all, is that, well, the first motivation, the main motivation is that Kagome compounds don't come uh, isotropic in nature. So in nature, this is what we find when we go to actual uh, materials. There is actually a candidate material for this breathing um, Kagome antiferromagnet, which is this vanadium oxyfluoride compound. I'm, I, I don't dare to say the formula here, <laughs> okay? But there is this material, okay? This is something that actually exists in nature, all right? Um, and now, of course, from the theory point of view, there are many fundamental questions that we can ask here. Uh, first question is, well, you know, we know that the ground state of the pure Heisenberg quantum antiferromagnet on the Kagome lattice uh, is a very complicated quantum state. It looks like it's a quantum spin liquid. It was very hard to get to this uh, due to numerical simulations. Now, well, if we introduce this breathing anisotropy, uh, first question, is there a quantum spin liquid also? Or, or is there a phase transition to different phase? Or you know, what the hell is going on as a function of, of this anisotropy, all right? Now, it turns out that there are experimental signatures of a quantum spin liquid at the value of the anisotropy that is pretty far from one, 0 0.55. And then the question is, well, you know, uh, whether there is a phase transition and what type of phase transition we have uh, in here. So Thomas, you have a question. Yeah, very, very quick question. Just in Hamiltonian, it seems that you don't have coupling terms that couple the different triangles or is there something, am I missing something obvious here? It seems you just have these terms that go along. The oh triangle. no, 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 no. So you have no, you have so you have upper and lower triangles. So so this um don't oh, don't, sure, sure. Okay. don't don't be misled by, by the drawing, okay? okay <laughs> so the, the lower triangle is in gray, okay? It's this guy in here, okay? And this is coupling terms with within different uh, upper triangles also. Yeah, yeah sorry, stupid yeah. question. Thanks. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no worries. Excellent. Well, let's let's move on. So this is the question that we uh, wanted to answer, and we simulated this model using uh, two-dimensional tensor networks, in particular PEPs, and also projected entangled pair states. This is something that we did with Said uh, Jaromi, and also um, with Didier. 
uh, who is here and uh, with Frederick Mila. It was published in, in SciPost, all right? First, we consider the case of no anisotropy at all, just to benchmark uh, our methods. That means that uh, this ratio is equal to one. Now, this is the true kagome heisenberg antiferromagnet, And of course, uh, this is the ground state energy as a function of the bond dimension of the tensor network. Here we, well, you can see the results with different techniques, uh, project entangled simplex states uh, plus some simple environment. This is some mean field environment, no contraction at all. Uh, PSS plus some corner transfer matrix normalization group up to bond dimension 13. This was using, using simple update. Uh, simple update plus corner transfer matrix normalization group, but not on a simplex state, but an actual, on an actual PEPS. Um, this was uh, also giving pretty good results. In the end, the one that was working best for us was uh, projected tangle simplex states plus uh, corner CTMRG. Okay. Um, now we obtained results that were compatible essentially with, with the results obtained by other people. So um, of course there are lots of proposals out there whether the ground state of this model is a U1 gapless quantum spin liquid or a C2 gap quantum spin liquid and so on. Now what we observed here, here our goal was just to benchmark the numerics and um, well we saw that the thing that we are getting is compatible in principle with quantum spin liquid. And uh, since the uh, decay uh, of the energy as a function of the bond dimension is uh, algebraic, this seems to be an indication that it's a gapless quantum spin liquid. It's not a proof, okay? But there are people such as Tao Shang that claim that this could be an indication, even though I have to say that there are counter examples of this, okay? So I need to take this uh, with a little bit of care. So it looks like a gapless quantum spin liquid. Now, when we go to the other side of the uh, breathing anisotropy, uh, say uh, when this ratio is 0 0.01, uh, we also computed the ground state as a function of the bond dimension. And here is uh, how it looks like the ground state energy as a function this time of one over D. For large bond dimension, we observe that, you know, we get some very low ground state energies. Uh, again, using project entangled, entangled simplex states plus uh, CTMRG. And the results that we get are compatible actually with a nematic, with a nematic phase, all right? It's actually compatible. It tends to go to the number that was computed in this uh, nematic DMRZ calculation, all right? And this was a calculation done by Cecile Repelin. Uh, and we are actually finding the same type of state. Uh, it's a lattice nematic state like this one where we break uh, rotational symmetry but preserve uh, translational symmetry. That's, that's what we find. Now, we find a phase transition around 0 0.05 for the breathing anisotropy. Uh, this is, for instance, an example uh, for the, for the you know, two-point correlator, all right? That's where we find the phase transition. Uh, it's compatible with the result of the experiment that claimed that there was a quantum spin liquid here around 0 0.55, so that's perfectly fine. So it looks like there is a very big uh, quantum spin liquid phase and a small um, lattice nematic phase. Now, this uh, state, this nematic state, we check that it looks like it is critical. Uh, we computed the correlation function uh, along different directions on the Kagome lattice and along the direction of actually the stripes. We observed that, uh, you know, when we increase the bond dimension, the correlation function is compatible with being with an algebraic decay for a PEPS, okay? So when we compare this direction compared to the, uh, say, the, the, the orthogonal direction, uh, for the orthogonal direction, the decay was clearly exponential. Whereas here, we observed that, you know, correlations were still uh, very large uh, for, you know, for, for a reasonable number of sites. This is, we take this as an indication that the, it could be a critical state, what we have in here. Okay, so um, that's what I wanted to tell you about the breathing Kagome antiferromagnet. Now, I want to explain you some simulations that we did for three-dimensional bosons and also 3D Kitaev models at finite temperature. Long story short, we developed a tensor network algorithm in 3D that works on any lattice in 3D, okay, by considering a simplification of the environment. And uh, it works at finite temperature. So we are computing uh, finite thermal states of three-dimensional uh, quantum lattice systems um, in, any in any geometry. All right. Um, now, for the details of the algorithm, I invite you to have a look at the, the paper. This was done with SAID. It's essentially using simple update and also some simplified calculation of the environment. But we observed that it's working very, very accurately. 
Now, we apply this to a compute thermal stage of interesting systems, both in the cubic lattice and also on the pyrochlor lattice and more complicated structures, as I will tell you. As I was saying, this is based on a simple update, all right? And also on some mean field environment. So when we have to compute expectation values, we uh, resort to tensor network diagrams that look like that, okay? Now, we applied this algorithm to a system of uh, bosons, to just a bose Hubbard model uh, for hardcore bosons and also softcore bosons on the cubic and on the pyrochlor lattice. Here is an example of the results that we obtained for the, um, for the pyrochlor. Okay, no, sorry, this was for the cubic lattice. Um, for the case of uh, softcore bosons, so we allowed occupation numbers for zero, one, and two bosons per lattice size. Per lattice side, sorry, this is just the plot of the superfluid density uh, as a function of, you know, in this diagram where uh, vertical axis is the chemical potential, horizontal is the hopping, and this is for different temperatures. And, you know, clear at zero temperature, we see clearly the two uh, mod lobes. And when we switch on the temperature, this just melts. Okay, and that's exactly what we can see here. Opa, sorry, I don't know what I did. Okay. Now for the Cubic lattice, this is also another type of plot, uh, superfluid density and also density of particles. You can see it more clearly. How at zero temperature, we get the two lobes, okay? And now we switch on the temperature and the lobes disappear, okay? For soft core bosons, for hardcore bosons, on the pyrochlor lattice, we get exactly the same, but this time hardcore bosons, so either occupation zero or one. At zero temperature, we have a clear superfluid phase um, we switch on the temperature and it melts away until we end up having no superfluid at all, okay? Now, the message here is that we have uh, this tool to, to study this type of systems, uh, arbitrary systems in 3D or for arbitrary lattices, I mean, and um, at finite temperature. And this is really useful. This is, a, you know, computing this using some other method, it will be quite complicated. Now, I didn't, I didn't say that, but we are also working on, we have a fermionic version also of the code uh, and it's also working. And uh, we expect to have uh, interesting results also very, very soon. All right. Now we applied the same algorithm for a spin system, in particular for Kitaev models in 3D. Now, um, for the Kitaev model in 3D, uh, you know the Kitaev model is uh, you have a system of spin one halves on the on the vertices of, of some trivalent lattice. If the trivalent lattice is the honeycomb lattice, this is the usual Kitaev model on the honeycomb lattice, the original one. You can generalize that to 3D. There are lots of papers by Simon Treps and Maria Hermans on that. The hyperhonicum lattice, which is this one, is very interesting because in this lattice, the model is also exactly solvable and the ground state is vortex free, exactly as in the honeycomb lattice. So the same thing applies and one can solve it exactly. At zero temperature, the phase diagram is analogous to the one from the 2D. There is an abelian phase, there is also an abelian phase. Um, and, but it has something very interesting, which is that the specific heat at finite temperature has a double peak uh, behavior. Now, the first peak has to do with a quantum phase transition from a topological phase to a non-topological phase. Essentially, um, the gauge uh, degrees of freedom get disordered. Now, at very large temperatures, there is another peak in the in the uh, heat cap in the sorry in the specific heat, but that's not a phase transition. It's a crossover. All right, it's a thermal crossover, and that has to do with the fractionalization of, of the spins. So the spins uh, get fractionalized at a given uh, temperature scale into Majorana fermions, and that's exactly what this second peak at high temperatures is indicating. This is something that is well known, and this plot is qualitative, but using our technique, we were able to see this crossover at high temperatures, exactly. So, uh, and it matches very well the expectations and the precision, since it is not a pure phase transition, it actually it's actually very, you know, we can get this with, with a lot of accuracy. Actually, this is the entanglement scaling of the crossover temperature as a function of the bond dimension. We see that already for very low bond dimension, this is already converged. Um, whereas for the phase transition, the actual phase transition, the critical temperature, um, you know, uh, oops, what did I do? Sorry. Uh, we see that this in this entanglement scaling that we actually need to go to much larger bond, bond dimension than uh, what we have, okay? Excellent. Um, let's move on to simulations of uh, uh, two-dimensional systems using uh, symmetry. 
Uh, this is a project that we carried with uh, essentially Philippe Schmoll, who is, was my PhD thesis. He graduated some months ago, uh, but also with um, uh, more friends, uh, such as Matteo Ricci and also Suki Singh, who is now in, in Melbourne. Now, the idea here um, was to implement um, SU2 symmetry in PEPs at the numerical level, but not just proposing an answer and then optimizing over that answer. We wanted to build a library for SU2 invariant tensors and then apply that to do uh, calculations of ground states in two dimensions using SU2, all right? Now that has been done for U1 already, uh, sorry, for U1, for in one dimensional systems already uh, for many years uh, using MPS and there are many successful results. For two dimensions, this um, um, was more difficult. Uh, I think it was more a technical uh, difficulty, but nowadays uh, there are already quite a few calculations out there, okay? Now, the idea of symmetries in tensor networks is, uh, is simple. We have a symmetry, a global symmetry in the system. So we impose it at the level of the tensors in the tensor network. So our tensors are symmetric. Okay, so here U, B, and W are some, you know, some symmetry operations of whatever symmetry. And the fact that this, the tensor is invariant means that, you know, you uh, have essentially the same tensor after applying the symmetry transformation. Um, mathematically, I will not go into the details, but mathematically, this means that the tensor decouples into two pieces. There is one piece that is uh, the degeneracy part. Uh, that is where my, uh, let's say, my dynamical parameters or my variational parameters uh, are, okay? And then there is another part, which is called the structural tensor, which is completely fixed by the symmetry, okay? And essentially, you know, it's, it has to do with something called the intertwiners of the symmetry group. It's a piece that is fully constrained by the symmetry. So the symmetry in the tensor is imposing constraints and it implies that there is a piece that you cannot touch, okay? That's this uh, structural tensor. Now for a three-leg tensor, this piece is a Klebs Gordon coefficient. And actually, if you do SU2 symmetry, this is actually Klebs Gordon, okay, from angular, from, from angular momentum. So um, the structural part depends only on the group properties, whereas the degeneracy part is the one that is carrying your uh, variational parameters. We implemented this on tensor network algorithms for 2D in, in the case of SU2. So uh, we did this for infinite PEPs. Uh, there are different ways of implementing this uh, formalism. Um, the way in which we did it was using something called fusion trees. It means we reduce everything to trivalent tensors, all right, such as the ones that you can find in here. And then uh, these trivalent tensors, they are just the Klebs Gordon coefficients, which we know exactly the, you know, how the coefficients of these tensors look like. So we don't have to carry them in our simulations. We only need to know what is the structure of the, connect, of the connections between the different, between the different tensors. There is a tree structure. So we store this tree structure in the memory of the computer. We never store the, the structural tensor itself. And then it means that, you know, this is a very accurate way of, uh, of dealing with, uh, with symmetries in, in numerics, all right? Because we never store the actual coefficient. We just store the structure of the coefficient, okay? Um, and it's also very efficient. When we go to two dimensional systems, we find that this is a pretty good approximation. So um, for PEPs, um, for infinite PEPs, this is how the tensor network looks like. Uh, for a unit cell, that composes into a tensor, degeneracy tensor network and a structural tensor network, which where each one of the tensors in the PEPs, the structural part has, uh, uh, you know, it can be decomposed in terms of uh, fusion trees, all right, as in here. And then for infinite project entangled simplex states, which are very well suited to simulate systems on the Kagome lattice, um, we also have a decomposition like this one, okay? And here everything is trivalent, so we don't have to uh, come up with any inner structure at all. Now, we use this to simulate um, several models, and we wanted to really understand whether SU2 symmetry is useful in two-dimensional calculations. So the first thing that we simulated was the spin one bilinear bi-quadratic model on the square lattice. So this model, as a function of uh, the angle theta, has a uh, you know many different phases, but there is one particular point that we know is SU2 invariant, the ground state, which is uh, theta equals 0 0.21 pi. Opa, sorry. Now we simulated, uh, we computed the ground state of this model for this particular point, and then compared two solutions to to the numbers obtained by by U1 simulations using U1 symmetry by Philip Corbos. All right. 
and what uh, we found was uh, this plot. So uh, this is an example. Uh, this is the ground state energy as a function of uh, one over the uh, effective bond dimension, okay, the overall bond dimension that your PEPs will have. Um, for different uh, algorithms, first, no symmetry at all. It's this blue one here, then SU2 symmetry using uh, corner transfer matrices to compute the environment as it should be, or using a mean field environment, that's an approximation. And the one by uh, Philippe Corbos using U1 symmetry is the green one here, all right? Now, first conclusion uh, that we see, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, just to let you know that we still have uh, five minutes, more or less. That's fine. That's fine. So uh, first conclusion that we see here is that uh, the U1 symmetry is given slightly better results uh, in terms of lower energy than the SU2, OK? Um, and this was very surprising to us. So um, we think that this is due to the fact that the SU2 symmetry, we were using the same unit cell and even larger. And we think that this is because the SU2, perhaps in two dimensions, in some situations, may be too restrictive. We are just reducing too much and constraining the space of variational parameters, all right? Um, we are able to reach larger bond dimensions, but you know it may be that perhaps we are constraining too much the variational space, and the variational algorithms are having a harder time to find uh, the optimal solution. We did the same thing, same simulations for uh, spin one half Kamehameha Heisenberg antiferromagnet. We uh, obtained uh, nice calculations with a clean extrapolation. Here, the purpose was just to check that it is working and everything is compatible also with a quantum spin liquid. And also for the spin to Kagome Heisenberg antiferromagnet, which surprisingly we didn't find any previous work, um, in, we were able to reach very large bond dimensions, but still clearly one needs larger to reach convergence. And our results, they seem compatible with a quantum spin liquid, but since we didn't reach convergence, we cannot claim anything. Now, this is a summary of lowest energy, the, the lowest energies that we found. Uh, the take home message is that uh, using SU2 symmetry in 2D allows you to reach uh, larger bond dimensions. It allows you to have uh, low ener lower energies. That's systematically what we found. But however, it may be that it's over constraining your ansatz, okay? Uh, in such a way that perhaps using U1 symmetry uh, is a better idea than using SU2, depending on the, on the actual model. All right, that's the conclusion that, that we had. And now in the last, uh, I think I have one minute or two, I'm not sure. Um, let me just tell you about uh, something very exotic, which is about optimizing investment portfolios using tensor networks. And this is, um, you say, what is this crazy guy talking about here that has nothing to do with condensed matter physics, but this is, this is only gonna take two minutes and you realize in a second that this has to do something with condensed matter. So, uh, you know, Portfolio optimization is a canonical problem in finance, how to optimize the returns, maximize the returns of investments in a set of assets and minimize the risk, okay? Turns out that you can boil it down to, uh, to a cost function that has to do with some weights, which are your variables. There are some parameters here, which are the forecasted profits. There is a risk, okay, that you have to minimize. And then there are some extra constraints, such as a total amount of investment, and then a cutoff that you have to put on every investment. At the end of the day, it boils down to a cost function that looks like that. And this is a classical Hamiltonian of some continuous variable omega, all right? And this could be a continuous spin. If you discretize this spin in terms of bits, you end up having a quantum spin glass, all right? So this is nothing but an icing magnet that we know it's NP-hard to find the ground state of, okay? It's a super complicated problem, but if you fine tune very well the parameters here, you can just throw in here any quantum algorithm or, or tensor network algorithm that you have to find ground states of Hamiltonians, and then you actually can use it, uh, you know, to optimize portfolios, all right? This is a very nice application. Um, I'm telling you this because we did this in combination with BBVA, which is a bank in Spain, and they were interested in testing this idea, and we did it, and uh, it actually works. We did an optimization for 52 assets over eight years of real data, so you can go to the SP500, the NASDAQ, or whatever you want, catch the data, load it here, and then throw DMRZ to optimize it, and it actually works. It's, it gives very good results. Um, we have a comparison of state-of-the-art optimization methods. We also run some quantum algorithms that I will not explain here, but we also run tensor networks 
very some simple, very some very simple algorithm based on matrix plot states, nothing complicated, and it's actually working and reaching uh, you know state of the art solutions comparable to other methods, and uh, and in some cases even better. Okay, now take home message here is that you can also use uh, tensor networks uh, in other fields uh, beyond quantum many body systems because at the end of the day. Everything looks like an Isaac model, okay? So, uh, and I think this is a very nice application um, that has been carried out recently. So these are my conclusions, and I think that I'm already, uh, uh, I should be finishing, so I just leave it here. Thank you very much for your attention.